So good morning everyone uh, and welcome to the Brunch Club and I'd like to thank Peter Llewellyn and Medcoms Networking for the opportunity to talk about the evidence behind the AMWA, EMWA and ISMAP joint position statement. My name's Paul Farrow and I'm a Communications Director at Oxford Pharmagenesis and have been involved in the medical communications industry for nearly 12 years. So I have an active interest in uh, publications ethics and lead the Pharmagenesis Publications Ethics Research and, and Practice Group. And I also lecture as a guest at Oxford University on good publication practice. So today I want to talk about um, the, the joint position statement that has been released in January two, 2017 uh, by the American Medical Writers Association, the European Medical Writers Association and the International Society of Medical Publications Professional which talks about the role of professional medical writers in the preparation of medical communications around scientific research. So included within this uh, joint statement is, is the following statement. Professional medical writers support, helps authors and sponsors to disclose their research in peer-reviewed journals and at scientific congresses in an ethical, accurate and timely manner with ult the ultimate aim of advancing patient care. They also go on to say that professional medical writers have extensive uh, knowledge of ethical publications practices. Now, to be seen as, as credible partners in advancing patient care, we need robust evidence as an industry to be able to support these claims. And what I'm going to do over the next 15 minutes or so is walk through uh, the evidence base that's been built uh, since around 2010 that's used to support the claims of ethical, uh, uh, timely and accurate communications and, and good practice uh, knowledge of the guidelines. What I'm going to talk through is six, six papers that are cited in the joint position statement and a new recent paper or, or poster that was published at ISMAP earlier this year, which I hope when that's uh, published in a peer review journal will also add to this evidence base. So where I'd like to start here uh, is with a paper published in 2010 in The Right Stuff, that's the, the former journal of the uh, EMWA, and this was research conducted by Adam Jacobs. And Adam looked at uh, the uh, association between medical writing support and compliance with reporting of the consult guidelines in papers that were published in the journal Current Medical Research and Opinion between October, October 2004 and August 2009, and these papers described randomized controlled trials. So the, the two groups that he looked at were those that acknowledged medical writing support, of which there were 152, and a group where there was no or unclear if medical writing support was involved. And he looked at uh, sort of completion of the, the consort guidelines to see if there was a difference between these two groups of papers. So it's worth saying that most consort items were at least partially described in almost all of the papers but there were some items from the consort checklist that were poorly reported, and this was across both groups, those with and without medical writing support. And these are generally con uh, concerned concealment of random allocation, implementation of randomization, and the dates of recruitment and follow-up. It's worth also saying that as most of the papers were industry-sponsored, there wasn't the opportunity to evaluate whether industry support had, a, had a, an association um, with uh, compliance with reporting of the consort guidelines. What Jacobs, and his, uh, Jacobs found was, was that there was a greater completion of the consort checklist items associated with medical writing support. As you can see here, um, with uh, writing support, uh, the mean number of items completed was 16.9 um, versus 16.1 in the group uh, without writing support, and this was a significant, uh, a significant difference. However, if he then uh, modified the analysis to award half marks if items were, were, were present but not fully described, um, the, the difference, there was, again there was a difference 18.7 versus 17.5, but this was not significantly different between the two groups. So overall, uh, Adam Jacobs concluded that publications with acknowledged assistance from medical writers were more likely to comply with consort guidelines than papers did not. But and although the, the difference was statistically significant, the difference was small, uh, and actually the, the practical importance of what, he's found, what he found was unknown. So I'm going to come back to the, the question on accuracy uh, a little bit later. So next up, uh, I'd like to describe uh, a paper that is uh, used to, um, as the evidence behind uh, the point about ethical communication of, of scientific research. 
And this was a publication uh, published in uh, Current Medical Research and Opinion uh, back in 2011 by Karen Woolley and her colleagues at Proscribe Medical Communications in Australia. And this team looked at a systematic controlled retrospective study uh, of retraction for misconduct in papers that were indexed uh, on PubMed. So they identified 213 papers that had been retracted for misconduct and they compared this with a control group of papers that had been retracted uh, for mistakes. And then they looked for uh, the involvement of medical writing support, pharmaceutical company involvement and other factors related to uh, the background to the authors to look at whether the, the frequency of retraction for misconduct was different uh, and also look at the probability of retraction. And what they found was that publications retracted for misconduct rarely had medical writing support involved. You can see here on the, in, in the middle of this chart um, that medical writers were associated with only three of 213 papers that were retracted for misconduct. Uh, and on, from the pharmaceutical uh, company perspective, it was 3.8% of papers. But where medical writing support and pharmaceutical uh, company support were both involved, um, there were no retractions for misconduct. So when they looked at the odds ratio, or the likelihood uh, of retraction for misconduct, what they found was uh, that the odds ratio was lower when medical writing support or pharmaceutical company support uh, was involved, but the odds of retraction for misconduct were higher if there was a single author, if the first author had a previous history of retractions, or the first author was affiliated with a, a low or middle income com country. So they concluded that publications retracted because of misconduct rarely involved declared medical writing support or declared pharmaceutical industry support. And the risk to the integrity of the literature from non-commercial factors is just as important and should be managed with the same vigour and rigour as managing the risks from commercial uh, factors. So next up, I, I want to look at very quickly at two papers uh, that talk to uh, the, the knowledge of medical writers and publications professionals of ethical publications uh, guidelines. And I'm going to talk to, to two papers, the first of which by Marisic uh, and colleagues that was published in BMC Medicine in 2014. This was quite a large survey um, that was designed to understand the current challenges around authorship of industry-sponsored trials and develop guidance uh, to help make better decisions. Uh, the, the number of survey respondents was nearly 500 and this was roughly broken down into equal groups of clinical investigators, journal editors, publication professionals and medical writers. And what you can see uh, from this chart, um, which looks at the, the uh, familiarity with ICMJE guidelines, GPP-2 as it was at the time, and other guidelines, is that clinical investigators had a much lower awareness of these guidelines uh, than, um, than the other groups. So you can see here it's about, I believe it's 48%. What's a little bit more worrying is that only 28% tw of clinical investigators stated that they were not aware of any guidelines uh, related to publication of industry-sponsored studies. So that's uh, low awareness of, of uh, those and in, in a lot of cases none. Conversely, um, medical writers and publications professionals uh, were much more aware of guidelines. Uh, you can see here with ICMJE the, the level of awareness is up there with that of um, journal editors and obviously it's much higher for GPP-2. So the second paper I want to talk about in this area uh, is another survey, the, the Global Publication Survey, that was published in BMJ Open in 2014. And this again was a large scale survey with 469 respondents, this time targeting very specifically um, publications professionals. And most of the respondents, around 78%, said that they'd worked in medical publications for more than five years. Now, this was a, a wide-ranging uh, survey, uh, but there's, I think there's three pieces of evidence that really add to the, to the evidence in terms of knowledge of guidelines. First of all, uh, over 90% of the industry, agency, and CRO respondents uh, said that they routinely refer to, to GPP-2, as it was at the time, and the ICMJE requirements. Uh, most respondents, uh, at least 78% in the different groups, had received uh, mandatory training on ethical publications practices. And finally, over 90% of respondents' companies had publications guidelines or policies in place, 
uh, that required acknowledgement uh, of medical writing support in the publications. So added together, I believe that these two papers add weight to the argument that um, medical writers and publications professionals are aware of the guidelines and use them in their day-to-day -day practice. So next I'd like to talk about uh, some research that was conducted in our own group at Oxford Pharmagenesis in collaboration with uh, Sally Hopewell and Liz Wager uh, who have a, a background in, in publications ethics and guidelines. And this research was published last year in February in um, BMJ Open. And what we did was to, to do a, conduct a cross-sectional study looking at an asso the association between medical writing support and the quality of trial reporting very much building on, on the early work by Adam Jacobs. So we looked at articles uh, that had medical writing support declared that had been published in the Biomed Central journals that described randomized controlled trials. We identified 110 of those articles. And then as a control group, we took a random sample of articles um, with no medical writing support, of which there were 123. And we looked at the quality of reporting uh, based on the consult guidelines we looked at the quality of written English because uh, in these journals uh, peer review um, is, is open and, and that's addressed. And finally, because milestones are declared within the, uh, the process as well, we were able to look at the speed of acceptance and see whether there was a difference. And what we found um, was that there was a higher rate of reporting of consort items associated with medical writing support. So on this chart you can see uh, the, the majority uh, of the bars are over to the right hand side favouring medical writing support um, and we looked specifically at items uh, that Jacobs had shown uh, were often poorly reported and in a sub-analysis we were able to show uh, that this uh, association was irrespective of funding source so in this example uh, we looked at uh, consort checklist items that were reported uh, at least 50% fully reported uh, and, and compared groups. So you can see where medical, medical writing support was industry funded, about 38% of articles uh, had at least 50% of our items completely reported, and this was only 17.9% if there was no medical writing support in industry funded articles, versus 226 uh, in industry funded articles that didn't have, uh, medi sorry, in non-industry funded articles with no medical writing support. So there was a significant difference between both of those groups uh, compared with industry funding and medical writing support. So, as I said, we, uh, we were able to look at the quality of written English associated with medical writing support, uh, and this, this was as judged by the peer reviewers who were asked to decide whether the, the quality was acceptable, needed some correction, or was unsuitable for publication. And here we found about 80% of articles uh, were seen as acceptable in terms of the quality of written English by the peer reviewers. And this was significantly higher than the 47.9% uh, where medical writing support was, was not provided. Finally, we found a slight reduction in the speed of acceptance with medical writing support. Uh, so on average, uh, the, the amount of time uh, to get from submission to publication was to acceptance was... 23.9 uh, weeks with medical writing support versus 19.4 weeks without it. Uh, that was a significant difference. And if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the breakdown of the milestones, you can see the reason here being that papers spent longer in peer review and uh, the sponsors and, and writers spent longer uh, responding to those peer review comments. So next up, uh, sorry, so uh, just to conclude, uh, we concluded that declared writing support was associated with a higher quality of reporting of randomised contri controlled trials and the slight differences between the study groups uh, we thought didn't explain our findings. So I just want to touch on a, a couple of papers now that are, are not published in peer-reviewed journals um, but have been presented recently at the ISMAP meetings the first of which uh, addresses the question of the, the speed of, of reporting and this was conducted by Shruti Shah and her colleagues at uh, Siro Klin Farm in India and this was presented at uh, the uh, annual meeting of ISMAP last year in 2016. And what they looked at was the role of medical writing support in the timely dissemination uh, of data. So they looked at all new drugs that were approved by the Food and Drug Administration in 2014 of which there were 27. Uh, and they looked at the trial characteristics and, and they also searched PubMed to establish 
the publications associated with those trials and they did that on a set date late in February 2016. So they identified um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of publications which consisted of primary publications, secondary publications and other types of publications and they looked at the involvement uh, of medical writers in that process. And the primary aim of this research was to look at the timing of publications. And what they found um, was that primary publications with medical writing support were published significantly faster um, than those without medical writing support. Uh, and that was, was quite a big difference, so a 22.3 month difference in speed. Um, so the publications with medical writing support uh, were published in an average, a mean average, of 14.4 months after data were available from the trial and this was a significant difference versus those without medical writing support and this really hits the the aim that they were they uh, they sort of set for timely dissemination of research which they said was was basically primary publication within 18 months of study completion now you might think there's a, a difference here we showed in our research that there was uh, it was longer to acceptance um, with medical writing support, whereas Charitel show that it's, it's faster. But the two different research projects really are studying different things, and I think there are valid reasons why we would, we would see differences here, primarily with, with this being uh, looking at uh, new drugs uh, that were FDA approved, and therefore there's more pressure to get those uh, papers published quicker. As part of this research project as well, uh, Shah et al. looked at the quality uh, of the types of, of research that was being published. And you can see here in these two pyramids the, the hierarchy of, of evidence and the different types of, uh, uh, types of publications associated with uh, medical writing support on the left and no medical writing support on the right. And what you can see here is that where there was no medical writing support involved, there were a lot more narrative reviews and case reports. Uh, whereas where medical writers were involved, there was uh, a larger number of primary papers, post hoc analyses and systematic reviews. Um, so the authors here felt that um, medical writing had a significant impact on increasing the, the mix and complexity uh, of publications, um, decreasing random error and selection bias. So they concluded that medical writing support can help expedite data availability and timely dissemination of clinical data and it can also uh, provide more complex, uh, higher value evidence in the public domain and their research may be able to help uh, indirectly manage costs, eliminate duplication and, and also stimulate further research ideas. Finally, um, this is a, a piece of evidence that was presented at the European meeting of ISMAP in 2017 by William Gatchell and his colleagues. Um, which isn't mentioned in the, um, uh, the joint position statement, but as that evolves and as the evidence base evolves, I hope that it might be. And this was built on the COMPARE project, which is a project run by the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine here at Oxford University, which really looks at uh, out outcome switching um, in articles describing randomised control trials published in the top five medical journals. Now that the data from this group are publicly available and, and Gatchel et al accessed that to run a, a sub-study examining the relationship um, between outcome reporting, um, funding source and medical writing support. And as you can see over here on the right hand side uh, in the chart, industry funded, medical uh, industry -funded uh, articles with medical writing support had a, a, a lower or the fewest um, uh, number of, of um, switching of, of Pre, uh, of non-pre-specified outcomes. Now while this wasn't significantly different versus industry funded articles with no medical writing support, it was significantly different compared with non-industry funded articles with no medical writing support. So as the COMPARE project gets bigger uh, and more data becomes available, I'm hoping that they'll be able to look at this analysis uh, and uh, rerun aspects of it um, to show uh, a higher level of evidence that hopefully if it goes through the peer review process as with the Shah poster, um, will be published um, and, and add to the weight of evidence that we currently have. Now it's worth saying um, that I've given you a very top level overview uh, of the evidence from these papers and what I'd encourage people to do is go away and read those papers and make their own decisions about the quality of that evidence and the limitations of the research. But what I feel we're at now is a, there's, a, there's a growing evidence base that supports our role as, as medical writers in the ethical, accurate and timely dissemination of medical research. 
but it doesn't mean we need to stop there. We, we need more research, we need better research, stronger research, and we really should be aiming to publish this in peer-reviewed journals, um, not just at, at ISMAP and, and other conferences. Um, so I'd encourage uh, those authors to do that. We also should, should be getting involved in collaborating. So one of the things that we do at, at Pharmagenesis as part of people's career uh, advancement and progression is encourage them to come up with ideas for research projects that they can then go away and present at ISMAP and, and hopefully get into the peer-reviewed literature. So we, we can make a difference in advancing patient care. We just have to work hard to build that, that evidence base that shows that we do add value. And finally, just to say, uh, as well as doing it within your organisations, you should also be thinking about collaborating externally. Um, so you can see here uh, a title of a, a paper from the, the GAP team. Uh, so you can see here the title of a paper from the, the GAP team um, who collaborate to address uh, articles that are, are negative uh, towards uh, the medical communications uh, industry um, often citing unfounded evidence. Wouldn't it be great if we could give them the evidence that makes it into a proactive uh, conversation about the value of medical writing rather than being reactive in addressing the comments of our critics. So I'd like to leave it there. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Um, I, I'd like to, if anybody's in, interested in uh, research projects or, or, or bouncing ideas around, um, that can help us advance uh, the publication's ethics research. Uh, please feel free to contact me on these details. It would be great uh, to look at how others can get involved in, in building this evidence base for the future. Thank you.